Good evening, everybody. Um, happy Halloween um, and welcome to our Samhain August Science event. It's great to um, see so many of you here or know that so many of you are, are online. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a, an introduction to um, Samhain August Science, it's a Halloween inspired mini festival and it's created by us here at DIAS, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And it's the third year that we've been doing this and it brings together researchers from all of our different disciplines and that includes Celtic studies, theoretical physics and cosmic physics, which encompasses both astronomy and astrophysics and geophysics. So quite a broad spectrum of activities that we have here at Zayas and, and the Samhain August Science um, Festival is a series of, of free events uh, and this year we're exploring the, the dark side of science and of Celtic civilization and this is all to tie in with the Feast of Samhain. Um, and this is the basis of, of many of our modern day celebrations on Halloween. Um, so this year we have a specific theme for our festival and that is the boundaries of space and time and the secrets that lie there. Uh, so quite, quite a profound theme. And our, we've had a brief uh, series of speakers and they will take us from the edge of our understanding of the known universe um, at the event horizon of black holes to the more familiar landscapes around us um, and stories about place names that describe them. Um, from the mysteries of, of unseen dark matter and dark energy, um, to the stories of how scientists have unlocked hidden codes that are buried inside each of us. Uh, so uh, I'm really, really excited to be hosting tonight's event. Um, I should have introduced myself. Uh, my name is Katrina Jackman, um, and I'm from the, the Dias Astrophysics section. Um, and so it's, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to, to be here and to, and to be hosting you tonight. And this is a, a very special year for us at Dias. So this is our 80th anniversary celebration. And so this is just one of the many activities that we're doing to, to celebrate um, the 80th year of, of discovery here at Dias. Um, a couple of, of housekeeping or, or admin uh, points before I introduce our speaker. Uh, what we suggest is that all of the audience members have their cameras turned off uh, for the duration of tonight's event. And for your viewing pleasure, we suggest that you choose speaker view um, in whatever Zoom interface you are using and that, that will give you the best um, experience of, of tonight's event. Um, I do need to advise you that the event is recorded. Um, and we encourage a lot of, of chat and, and, and lively discussion um, after the speaker has finished. So he, he's very, very happy to engage um, in Q&A with all of you. And the way that we're gonna run that is that we would like you to type your questions into the Zoom chat, if you can, and then I will moderate um, those questions with the speaker at the end. Um, so uh, on to uh, our speaker. So it's my absolute pleasure um, to uh, host Professor Alex Murphy this evening. He is a nuclear and particle astrophysics and he's based at the University of Edinburgh. And his interest is in the origin and nature of matter in the universe. So he has a, a BSc and a PhD from the University of Birmingham in the UK. He spent some time working in the US as a postdoctoral researcher before returning to the UK at, to Edinburgh as a lecturer and then a reader and now a professor. And his eminent research includes the experimental and computational determination of the most important nuclear reactions involved in stellar explosions and the direct search for dark matter in deep underground laboratories. And I, I have had a sneaky peek at, um, at what he's gonna tell you about tonight and, and it's, it's a fascinating topic. So I'm, I'm delighted to introduce him. I hope that you all enjoy yourselves. And I will now pass over uh, Professor Murphy and um, yeah, you can share your screen and, and take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katrina. Um... It's a delight and an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, it, it's, it's indeed an honor to be part of such a, an exciting program of events uh, in an, an auspicious year. Um, and I hope that what I'm gonna talk about today does the, uh, the, the festival justice. So I'm gonna share some slides um, and I need to remember to tick that button and hopefully this should work, right. So, Right, so what I'd like to emphasize as well is that as I go through these slides, if you want to be making questions, think about things that have not made quite clear enough, um, please, um, I am more than happy to stay on after the 
uh, talk itself um, to try and answer as many of the questions uh, that you have as possible. So this first slide is showing a sort of um, animated GIF going on about Dark Matter Day. So actually for the past few years, um, internationally around the world, we've tried to designate um, October 31st, Halloween, as Dark Matter Day. And there's been a series of events over the past few years associated with it. And, and choosing this day is because dark matter, ooh, a bit scary, a bit spooky. Um, but really it's about, um, th there's a huge demand to try and understand what, what we mean by dark matter. There's a lot of um, misunderstanding about it as well. So uh, building on that enthusiasm, we want to try and encourage people uh, to recognize what the science is, recognize the scientific um, methodology that we're using and how we cope with something that's unknown. Uh, and that's, that's actually quite a, a deep and important skill uh, in, just in terms of everyday life, as well as being um, interesting for um, the science itself. Um, I've also got a link at the top of the page here that you may be able to see, which is uh, www.facebook.com slash Sanford Underground Lab. Um, and if you go there, then um, you'll find a bunch of videos that are associated with the, um, what I'm talking about today, um, uh, including an event just a couple of days ago where we actually had a, uh, a link up between a UK laboratory and a US laboratory. And there was quite a lot, quite a lot of, um, at the time, live tours underground. So you can see the kind of environment there a little bit, or there you can see the environment a bit more easily that we try and work in and do this, um, this science. The, the title of my talk is Dark Matter, the true story of things that go bump in the night. Um, sort of for, so appropriate for tonight, uh, and hopefully you'll understand why I'm describing it like that in a moment. So uh, at about five past six um, in the evening in Dublin, 31st of October, as in pretty much right now, if you look up into the sky, um, you should, uh, can I make this, give me a, um, I'm not sure I can, uh, do, 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 I was hoping to give me a, Oh, well, um, up here, you can see the mouse at this point. There's, um, so, so well, this is the night sky looking broadly to the south. Uh, you can see Saturn and Jupiter low, low in the sky to the south, if, if it's a nice cloudless sky and you can see low enough on the horizon. Mars is very bright at the moment. Um, looking further up into the sky, not quite overhead at this time of year, but close to it. Um, you can see the, the Northern Cross. This is uh, the constellation of Cygnus. And it's uh, Deneb is up here and you've got Vega there and Altair there. And this is the, the Northern Cross and, and the importance and relevance of that I'll, I'll mention again slightly later. If you were to wait a few more hours into the night looking up at the, actually to the Northern Cross, you'll see that that's exactly where the Milky Way uh, runs across the sky. Here's a, a fairly good image of the Milky Way. Um, but if you, as you look at this, what is it telling us? Well, um, there's the first thing, there's a, an astronomer, um, Alan Ranyard, I think it was, or Andrew Ranyard. Um, he, he was the first to recognize that these, sort of the dark patches in the sky, this is actually dust, which is, it's not that there's, 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 there's dark, it's not that there's an absence of stars there, there's a roughly, um, a sort of a, a broadly sort of, well, a distribution of stars, which doesn't vary as much as we can see in this image. The dark patches are because there's dust obscuring the stars behind it. And that was one of the first, he was one of the first people to recognize that there may be things in the, um, in, in, a, in cosmology, in astronomy, in, in space that we can't see. So we can't actually see the dust and we only know it's there by, by the fact that it's obscuring what's behind it. And that's kind of a, a philosophical point to recognize that there's, there's more out there than we can actually see. Um, a few years later, um, actually in 1904, uh, Lord Kelvin, um, brilliant Irish Scots uh, physicist. He was a real celebrity at the time, and he was kind of a, a bit of a diehard of the, the end of a generation at some level. He was hanging on to um, sort of the, the pre 20th century revolution in thinking that came with Einstein and etc. cetera. Um, one of the things he did though, he, he was a real celebrity of the day, kind of like the, the Brian Cox of the day, I guess. Um, he gave a really well attended and very famous series of lectures in America, now known as the Baltimore Lectures. Really quite, it's remarkable because if you look at the content of those lectures, it's really very advanced stuff with lots of differential calculus 
Um, and it's hard to believe that this was popular in the um, general public, but it, but it really was. Um, one of the examples he gave was really relevant. He looked at stars in the Milky Way, our galaxy, and he, um, he treated them as a gas, which was, uh, he was just going through a, this was just an example of trying to do sort of classical physics dynamics. And as a, a novel example of it, he used um, the stars in the Milky Way and thought of them as a gas. In doing so, he then developed something called a, a velocity dispersion. I'll mention that again a little bit later and explain kind of what we mean. But um, uh, for the moment, just take it as some fancy kinematic understanding of how the stars in our Milky Way we were, were moving around. An analysis of that, that data revealed that there must be many more stars in our Milky Way than we could actually see. And he, he wrote in his lectures, many of our stars, perhaps a great majority of them may be dark bodies. So in this respect, Lord Kelvin was actually the first person to recognize that there's a lot more matter in our galaxy than we can see. see. And this is the the, the sort of first inkling of dark matter, of something, of there being additional um, weighty substance material generating gravity floating around in our galaxy. Now, over the next few years, um, several other physicists came into the debate, um, but it was only kind of a debate. It wasn't really this, this um, I forget the number. Did I write it down here? I don't think I did. Um, I think Kelvin found um, of order a factor of 100 or something too much um, or more, there must be about a factor of 100 more matter in our galaxy um, that, than he could account for just by looking at the stars. However, um, a reanalysis of, of Thompson's work by others such as Cap Capitin and uh, Oort um, revealed that the, um, it was a, a less conclusive um, difference. There was also, over this time, a much better understanding of the Milky Way was developing. I mean, um, Kelvin's Baltimore lectures were in 1904. It was only until I think 1924, I think it was, that Hubble um, recognized a, uh, a, a variable star um, or a, a star in a variable nebula. And from that was able to work out that there were um, the planetary nebulae were actually objects well beyond the size of our galaxy. Until at the time that this was done, it was thought the entire universe was, was, was just our galaxy or our galaxy was the entire universe. So this was a time of great change where a better understanding of the Milky Way was developing. And so these kind of uncertainties over the amount of actual mass in our and number of stars in our galaxy, it wasn't really that um, remarkable. Uh, there were so many things changing. Uh, that wasn't a particularly strong aspect. Um, and anyway, everyone was assuming that any such dark material must, be, must just be like dust or faint stars that we can't see. Of these uh, characters that I mentioned here, one in particular probably needs particular recognition, which is Henri Poincaré, because in one of his papers, he gave the phrase uh, dark matter to describe this material. So he was the first person to describe this discrepancy between the observed amount of um, stars in our galaxy and the amount of material of matter in our galaxy and gave it a name, dark matter. Um, so this, this takes us to around about the 1930s or so, and at that point, I'm going to mention there's two particular troublemakers who uh, arrived on the scene who really shook things up. Um, the first, first person on the left here is Fritz Zwicky, and on the right, we've got Vera Rubin, who was then in the 1960s and 70s was her major work. Focusing on Fritz Zwicky to start with, um, Fritz Zwicky was a truly remarkable person. Uh, he made an absolutely astonishing number of extraordinary contributions to science. Um, Swiss by birth, worked mainly in America, but never changed his nationality. A list of some of the things that he's credited for. Um, he, he was the first person to um, provide a, a kind of a model for um, supernovae and, and the, um, how neutron stars worked. And neutron, the neutron itself had only been discovered a year before Zwicky realized that this meant things like neutron stars must be around. He was the first person to understand or provide a, a decent model um, for co galactic cosmic rays. He, he was a co-founder of um, a truly remarkable uh, step change in astronomy with the development of the Palomar Observatory, which was jointly run with Walter Bade, who we'll mention again in a moment. 
He predicted gravitational lensing by galaxies, which is now absolutely forefront astro astronomy. Uh, he pr proposed the existence of, of clusters of galaxies. So rather than a galaxy being a formation of stars, there are things called galaxy clusters where multiple galaxies uh, orbit around one another. He, he led the development of a large catalog of uh, observations in the stars known as the Zwicky catalog. And that really is one of the main catalogs. Even to this day, it's an important one. He personally dis discovered um, at least 120 uh, supernovae and then an extra one which he co-discovered with someone else. And just until 2009, that was a record, uh, which, which, and that's been surpassed because of automated searches. Um, not only in, science, in physics and astronomy was he a leader. He, he was the, he, in some countries, he's known as the father of the modern jet engine. He, he at least claims to be the first person to have ejected an object into orbit, essentially putting a, an explosive, explosive on the front of a rocket, firing the rocket up into the atmosphere and then exploding it, and then with enough force so that some of the fragments got put into orbit. So the first person to um, take anything within our atmosphere and eject it out into space. If we explore another planet sometime, um, especially in terms of how we discard waste, he wrote these statutes that describe um, the, the sort of legal process about how we go about doing that. And he developed something known as the morphological analysis, which is really quite powerful, but has unfortunately kind of fallen into um, disregard now. And you could go on with the things he did. Um, he was truly an, an astonishing uh, generator of ideas. He's widely credited with discovering dark matter. I think nowadays we tend to think that was actually um, Lord Kelvin, J.J. Thompson, etc. Um, he's also widely credited with using the name dark matter, but no, you can just read in the literature. That was definitely Boncare. Um, however, he is a man of absolutely infamous character as well. A couple of examples of that I'd like to share with you. So his boss when he was at Caltech was Jesse Greenstein. And he wrote, um, I disliked him as a human being. He was vain and very self-centered. Zwicky so had an enormous facility to produce radical new ideas, some of which pro uh, pro proved to be correct, kind of indicating that many didn't as well. Um, but a lot of us wish he had not been so rough in the process. Slightly later, he wrote also, um, he was recalling the feud between Zwicky and Bada, which was um, kind of became quite famous. Zwicky called Bada a Nazi, which he wasn't, and Bada said he was afraid that Zwicky would kill him. They became a dangerous pair to put in the same room together. So he's, he's a very controversial, um, uh, un, at some level unpleasant person to work with, and yet you can also read up that he did huge amounts of humanitarian work and undergraduate students loved him. He was a great explainer of concepts and ideas. And I think the takeaway from that is that people are complicated. Anyway, um, what did he do um, with regard to dark matter? So using the Palomar Observatory, they observed the coma cluster of galaxies. So this is quite a powerful image. In fact, this is not the image that he was looking at. It's a more recent one, but it's worthwhile just pausing for a moment to think about what, what, is, what are a thousand galaxies. So you can almost by eye, you can see that there's a cluster of objects here, some of which are, uh, have a finite size to them and they can, you can actually tell that they're uh, galaxy-like objects. These bright square or bright diagonal things in the foreground, those are, those are foreground stars. So it's some of the objects in the back that we're talking about, the, the diffuse fuzzy ones. And these are a, a collection of galaxies that are um, clearly, maybe not so clear, but they're orbiting around them uh, a sort of common center. They're, they're a cluster of things that are gravitationally bound to one another and they're moving about one another. But each of these galaxies has roughly 100 billion stars in it. So here where you're looking at a thousand galaxies, that's 100,000 star, 100,000 billion stars that you're looking at. And we now know, now, nowadays know that each star typically has something like one, two planets around it, or rather some, some stars have many planets around them, some have none, but at least on average, it's one or two stars, um, one or two planets, maybe more per star. So, so when we're looking at just this tiny image of the sky, this is not much of the sky at all. That's 100,000 billion planets out there. Um, quite an astonishing idea. And uh, there's a lovely cartoon about this, which is if my work helps just one person 
feel like a tiny insignificant speck lost in a cold, uncaring universe, then I'm doing my job. Uh, quite a nice little quote. Uh, and if you're an amateur astronomer, at least 10 of these are observable with a, with a good amateur telescope. Okay, um, but what did he do with this? So looking at these uh, galaxies, um, this was work repeated by, or independently done a few years later by Sinclair Smith, um, who, who looked at the Virgo cluster, came to the similar con conclusions. We're looking at the Coma cluster in about 1933, 1934. Zwicky used Doppler shifts um, to obtain each galaxy's speed. So this is the, the similar idea to where you have an ambulance going past you and you hear the tone of the ambulance change. With um, st uh, light sources that are moving away from us, we find that the, um, the light gets shifted to a different wavelength. It's red shift because things typically go redder, going to longer wavelengths, larger wavelengths. So looking at this shift of the wavelengths that you could see in these galaxies, he could work out the speed of them. And if you assume that the galaxies are all part of a, of a single gravitationally bound cluster, which is reasonable because otherwise you have to come up with some kind of idea of how they by coincidence all happen to be near one another. If you make that assumption that they're all the same all around the gravitationally bound cluster, then you can assume that the galaxies are behaving like a, a gas where they individual galaxies are moving around and sort of going out and then coming back in again, like a sort of a diffuse gas. So this is actually very similar to the way that uh, Lord Kelvin did his work with a, a velocity distribution dispersion. So then from the speeds and, and how they're distributed, you can determine how much mass there must be to, to provide enough galaxy to hold these, this sort of cluster of galaxies together. And that thing is called the dynamical mass. Let's give it a letter M. I'm not gonna use equations much in this at all, don't worry. That you can then do the same again, similarly to Lord Kelvin did and compare this number, this amount of mass um, to the amount of uh, mass you'd expect just by counting the number of stars. So you take the number of uh, galaxies and multiply by the number, average number of stars in a galaxy and the average mass of each star. And that gives you a, an amount of luminous mass, let's call it M. And then if you take um, the ratio of the two together, uh, I'll just emphasize this is very similar to Thompson's analysis, Kelvin's analysis, um, published in 1933 in German. Um, here's the abstract of that, of that paper. Uh, let's translate the important bit into English. Uh, dot, 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 the coma system would have to be at least 400 times larger than that derived on the grounds of observations of luminous matter, of light. If this were to be confirmed, we would get a surprising result that dark matter is present, present in a much greater amount than the luminous matter, which is re remarkable, okay? Um, we can look at all the stars and uh, galaxies and the gas and everything else, and that yet we can tell by the, the way the stars are moving around and how the galaxies are moving around, that there must be much, much more there to provide the gravity to hold it together. Now, one aspect of this, just with Lord, as with uh, Lord Kelvin's work, um, the initial med, uh, calculations came up with a larger, larger difference. Again, with, with uh, um, in Zwicky's case, if you look at the coma clusters today, the modifying the parameters that he used to sort of more conventional or more modern estimates of those, you still come up with a difference. It's about a factor of 10 rather than 400. Um, but still, it's, it's a big factor. So was the existence of this dark matter instantly accepted? No, I mean, there were too many uncertainties. That's kind of reflected in the fact that the factor of 400 has now gone down to a factor of one, of 10. So there's clearly some assumptions there, uh, uncertainties there. And there's also these assumptions that you bring into it, which maybe those are wrong. There's also, of course, the big factor, it was Zwicky. And Zwicky's personality was such that a lot of people didn't want to believe what he was saying anyway. So then over the next few years, um, there was, this was known, but it wasn't particularly accepted. I'm then gonna to turn to Vera Rubin. So again, Zwicky was a remarkable character, at least equally, so was Vera Rubin. Um, she, she was a, one of the far, our first women in Western astronomy. Um, on application to Princeton, she was just told blankly, Princeton does not accept women. Um, so she went to Cornell and worked with Hans Bethe and Richard Feynman, and then went to Georgetown and worked with George Gamow. Uh, Hans Bethe, Richard Feynman, George Gamow, these are absolute superstars of physics. So she, and, and you don't get to work with a superstar in physics unless you're pretty damn good yourself. 
So they could recognize the quality of Vera Rubin very early. And she obviously, she will have had a fabulous training from them. And she, in fact, she turned out to be the first um, woman to use this great Palomar Observatory uh, that Bardo and, and Zwicky were running. Um, and uh, it's worth pointing out that she, she wasn't working alone in this. In particular, she worked with a guy called Ken Ford who de developed a really sensitive spectrometer that allowed her to make the measurements that she did, but she was still the one making the measurements. And one of her first things she did was this, she actually confirmed Zwicky's claim that there could be clusters of galaxies. So rather than just clusters of stars, which is a galaxy, but clusters of galaxies moving around one another. That was one of the first things she did, um, but her, what she's known for comes a little bit later. So this is in uh, roughly in 1970s when this work was published. Some of the work was, uh, leading up to that was in the 60s. This is a, an image of the Pinwheel Galaxy by Hubble Space Telescope. And just by looking at it, you can tell very visually, it's very obvious that this is a, a body of stars that are rotating around one another. Um, this is not one, one of the useful ones for what um, uh, Vera Rubin was working on. You need, she needs a galaxy that's side on, so more like this one, which is NGC 5866. Now, if you do that, um, knowing that the stars are actually going around in a circle, you know that on one side they're moving towards us and on the other side they're moving away from us. So you can take advantage of that and you can um, calculate or you can measure, again using Doppler shifts, um, how fast they're moving, we'll call that V for velocity, um, and plot that as a function of the distance from the centre of the galaxy. And the expectation is something like this shape. Uh, it would take a, another minute or two to explain why you expect the uh, stars to move in with that kind of distribution of speeds. It's just basic Newtonian um, physics. It's the same as you get out if you consider it in general relativity more, more in more modern times. But if you just consider the stars going around one another, you'd expect something like the green distribution. However, Vera Rubin's measurements always showed something more like the red, dis red line. So in particular, what this is showing is that at larger radii, further away from the center of the galaxy, the stars are rotating around uh, the galaxy much faster than you would expect. Just if you, if you um, assume the laws of gravity as we know them here in the, in the solar system. So uh, can we explain that in some way? Well, okay, so let's sort of picture a galaxy here. If, if I was in Dublin in person, at this point, I'd bring out a string with a ball on it and furiously spin it around my head. It's a little bit harder to do that over the internet. But please imagine in your, your head, me holding a ball on a string and spinning around my head. If I want to spin that ball faster, I more furiously spin my hand and the tension in the string will get a lot, lot uh, tighter. Um, I'll have to have more forces involved. So to make the ball go faster around in a circle, like the stars in the galaxy going faster around in the circle, you need more force. So the force is proportional to the speed, or okay, technically it turns out to be the, the speed squared. Um, so if we need, if we are observing things going faster than we were expecting, well, we need more force there. The force is coming from gravity, so we need more gravity. And where does gravity come from? Well, it comes from matter, so we need more matter. And so that, and the other thing is that that matter is dark. So we call it dark because we can't see it. It's just invisible to us. Uh, technically, I think, I think a lot of us would prefer us to, to actually call it invisible matter. It'd be a better phrase for it. But dark matter is the way, is the name it's come up with. Um, now, in fact, this, uh, these measurements of rotation curves, um, I just to emphasize, this is my first year lectures that I give at the University of Edinburgh. This is now so embedded in our understanding of um, astronomy. This is now first year undergraduate material and you can derive what the expected distribution is. And we go over Vera Rubin's measurements and, and show where, why them, this implies there must be dark matter. Um, and let me point out that this is not, if you look out into space and look at other galaxies, you can see this in the other galaxies implying there may be dark matter there, but you can do this for our own galaxy. And this is an image of the data from our own galaxy. And again, you can see it sort of rises on the left and then flattens out. It doesn't fall away with larger radius as you'd expect from just Newtonian gravity. So this is telling us that dark matter is here in our galaxy. This is not something far off away. This is here, this is for, for where we are. 
Um, Vera Rubin unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, a lot of us are rather sad that she never won a Nobel Prize. I think that's our fault for never confirming her model and confirming that there's dark matter in the universe. A lot of us feel that she perhaps deserved it anyway. However, more recently, um, a major telescope, the Large Synoptic Sky Survey, um, has been renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory. And that, that's a really nice uh, honor to her uh, for the future. And it's a really exciting observatory. It's gonna give us the deepest, as it says there, the deepest, widest image of the universe. It's gonna be a fabulous advance. Okay, so Kelvin, Zwicky, Rubin, they're all finding evidence that there must be more extra unseen matter in the universe. But perhaps there's another exact uh, explanation, something much more mundane. Clearly, you can't go and invoke a whole new uh, component of the universe without a lot more evidence than just a few rotation curves and um, looking at how the motion of uh, a few stars and galaxies. Is there independent evidence? Yes, there is. There's much, much more evidence. Um, here's a, a collection of plots that would, um, you could have extra seminars on each of these. Uh, there's things like the bullet cluster um, in the lower right, where you've got galaxies that have passed through each other. At the top left, there's the cosmic microwave background. Um, there's things like baryonic acoust acoustic oscillations, which are, um, I could talk about other times. There's weak lensing measurements. There's Big Bang nuclear synthesis. All of these, I think the important thing is to emphasize that, um, actually, I'll switch to this one. All of these give a, con a consistent conclusion. And that consistent conclusion is that the matter content of our universe, of our galaxy and all the other galaxies that we can see, or pretty much all the other galaxies, there's a few changes here and there, they look something like this. And about 10% of the galaxy is made of hydrogen left over from the Big Bang. There's then about a quarter as much helium, which is also essentially left over from the Big Bang. And then there's all the other elements that we know about. Astronomers collectively call those metals. And there's about half a percent or something of the content of the galaxy is made of metals of something heavier and more complicated than hydrogen and helium. And then there's, if you add up all the neutrinos, some subatomic particle, I'll actually talk a little bit about those later. If you add up all of those together as well, that's maybe as much as the, as the metals, but that's clearly the total content in the universe has to be hundred percent. So where's the rest? Well, it's dark matter. So this dark matter, this content that we can't see dominates the galaxies. Uh, and we don't know what it is. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but it's, it's really important. This is the, not only is it an important content of what we've got, it's actually the dark matter which has been responsible for shaping the galaxies that we have. The, the fact that the universe looks as it does today is not really because of the matter in it, it's because of the dark matter in it. Um, and the future of, a, of our galaxy and the universe is gonna depend largely on the dark matter, not on the um, other normal matter. So uh, this is really important stuff. I'll quickly let it back to this image again, which is to emphasize, this is a slightly, I've, I've mentioned some very technical, difficult concepts um, as we go along here, but it's, it's actually as simple as looking out of a window at a tree blowing around in the wind. And certainly here in Edinburgh, we've had a hell of a lot of wind today. Um, so what is the wind? We can't see the wind, um, just like we can't see the dark matter. But we can tell it's there because of the influence it's having on things that we can see. In this, here, here in this slide, it's looking at a bush blowing around in the wind. But if we consider the stars moving around in the galaxy and the, galaxy, and the clusters of galaxy, galaxies moving around in the universe, it's their movement blowing around. And from that movement, we infer what, that there must be this wind of uh, dark matter behind it, making it have the motions it does. So that's really the concept that we're using here for identifying for telling us that there's dark matter in the universe. Okay, so we see that dark matter. Um, what are its characteristics? Well, it's clearly got gravity. That's how we're test telling it's there. It's making things move around. We can't see it. And um, electromagnetism is the fundamental force that, uh, that interacts with photons and, and generates light. So the fact that we can't see it tells us that whatever this material is, it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force. For similar reasons, um, if it interacted with the strong nuclear force, that too would generate uh, things that we could see. It would generate photons, it would generate gamma rays and things like that. We don't see those coming from dark matter, so it cannot have a strong nuclear force associated with it. 
the um, at fundamental level, there are four forces in the universe. Hopefully many of you know that. Gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, also the weak nuclear force. Could dark matter have a weak, a weak nuclear force? We've never tested it or we've never been able to tell, but there's good reasons to think that it might do. And in fact, it's gonna be that measurements using the weak nuclear force that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But we think it probably does have a weak nuclear force there. There are some other things as well. We think the dark matter must be forming these large halos around, our ga around the galaxies. So our galaxy is spinning around inside a halo of dark matter. We think the dark matter itself is moving around quite slowly. Technically, we call that being cold. And we also, for even more technical reasons, we think that whatever this dark matter is, it's not just something like dust or, or planets that we can't see. It's made of something which is non-atomic. Technically, we call it non-baryonic. It's something which was produced, um, that was not produced in the Big Bang. So that's begging the question, so what is dark matter? Well, frankly, the best name I can give you, or the best description I can give you, is that dark matter is the name. That's all it is. It's the name to whatever it is that's causing this additional gravitational attraction on the scale of gal galaxies. Um, so no, we don't know what it is, but we do have some good ideas. And to try and explain those, I'm now gonna switch into a brief detour into particle physics. So I have to secretly admit, or not secretly, openly admit, this is one of the reasons I really love this kind of subject because we, we, we're looking at things on huge scales of the entire universe and galaxies and clusters of galaxies, but we also have to look at things at the scale of individual subatomic particles and particle physics. It's really bringing lots of ideas together in a lovely way. So as an example, um, what, what is an electron? Um, you, hopefully many of you have heard of electrons, normal nuclear matter is made of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Um, and these are one of the fundamental particles that we have. What is an electron? Well, people have been thinking about this for a while. Niels Bohr commented that isolated material particles are abstractions, their properties being definable and observable only through their interaction with other systems. So I can't really tell you, here's a picture of an electron, and this is what it looks like. That's not the way it works. Unfortunately, all we can say is that it's got a certain set of properties. The properties that we know about for an electron turn out to be these. It's got some kind of amount of mass, turns out to be very small. Um, it's got an electric charge, turns out to be, the way we've defined it, it's negative. Um, that's just the way it got defined along the way. We decided that an electron had an, a negative charge. I mentioned these um, fundamental interactions. Uh, it does have a strong, sorry, it does not have a strong, strong nuclear force interaction. It turns out it does have a weak interaction and it does have an electromagnetic interaction. It's got a quantum mechanical property known as spin, which is a half units of H bar in fact. And then it's got some other technical quantum numbers. Um, these are just the ways that in fundamental physics, we describe the properties of these uh, fundamental particles. It turns out it's got a baryon number of zero and a lepton number of one. It's also got other properties as well, uh, like a lifetime. It turns out the electron we think is totally stable. Um, many other particles are not. To con contrast that, okay, what's, a, what's an anti-up quark? So this is another one of the, the fundamental um, particles of our universe. It's got a different mass, it's got a different charge. It turns out it does have a strong interaction. It also has a weak and electromagnetic interactions and it's got a spin of a half, baryon number, lepton number, whatever. Okay, so these are, these are the ways that we define the fundamental particles in our universe that we know about. And here's a collection of all the fundamental particles that we know about. And we think this is a, um, well, within caveats, this is kind of a complete set of them. We call this the standard model of particle physics. And at the lower left here, that E is re representing the electron that I talked about. And the top right purple one is the top quark that I just mentioned. Um, and the different colors here indicate types of particles that um, have similar properties for various reasons. So there's some really important things to note here, which is why do the fundamental particles have these particular values for all of these uh, properties that we've given them? We don't know, that's, that's a mystery to us. Um, these are just, they are what they are. We'd love to know why, why they have the values they do. Why are there only these particles? Why are there, why do we have something with the properties of an electron and not something with additional properties slightly different from an electron? Guess what, we don't know. It's actually rather complicated. Why are there so many? There's, I've listed here, um, 
17 particles, it seems very complicated to have 17 fundamental building blocks. Not one of these is sort of built from parts of the other ones. These are, these are the, the minimal things. Why are there so many of them? Um, and of course, are these actually truly fundamental or are they built from something smaller? Uh, again, we don't know. So this is really interesting stuff. And really, there's a lot of questions here that we would love to get to our heart, get our uh, teeth into. So, okay, within that context, where does this new stuff called dark matter fit into the standard model of particle physics? Well, it's not got an electromagnetic interaction, which means it can't be any of the quarks and it can't be the charged leptons as they're known. It can't be the, pho the photon because that is that is light. Uh, and it turns out it can't be the W bosons because they're charged. It's not got a strong interaction, gets rid of the quarks again, gets rid of gluons. It's stable, so it can't be a couple of other particles. And we know about neutrinos and we know that there's much more dark matter in the universe than can be accounted for with neutrinos. So this is the heart of the problem. Um, there's nothing in this standard model of particle physics that can explain dark matter. So the existence of dark matter is telling us something genuinely new. It's, it's exciting. It's something which we don't have a, an explanation for at the moment. What could it be? I can see that I'm running over time a little bit. My apologies. I'll try and get through the lecture on time. Um, there are many ideas from, if you ask a, a theorist, there's probably as many theories of what dark matter might be as there are particle physics theorists in the universe, which is quite a large number. Um, but fundamentally, we don't know what it is, but we do have some indications of which of these may be more likely. I'll just very briefly mention a few of them, that probably the strongest or the most favoured model still for dark matter is it something called a, a weakly interacting massive particle. So that's the, the weak force that I was telling you about before, the massive because it's actually quite heavy. And there's a, there's a natural candidate for what a WIMP might come from. Um, whereas just describing about all these things that we don't understand about why are there so many particles, why do they have the properties that they do, those kind of questions. There's a model called supersymmetry, or an idea that clever theorists have, um, in which it turns out you actually double the number of particles, um, what, which sort of looks like it makes it more complicated. Well, it does, but it actually sort of answers some of those questions as well. So that's quite attractive. And at the lightest of these extra family of particles that we've generated, indicated here on the right, the lightest of those would actually be a really good candidate. It's got all the right properties for this, um, for the dark matter. Other ideas for what it might be, uh, is things called axions. Um, now the axions, we think for other completely independent reasons, we think that there must be things called axions. We never worked out, discovered them before, but there's a the way that the strong force and the weak force behave is slightly different. Um, and a way of explaining why those two have this different character uh, is explained by if there's this new fundamental particle, it turns out to be called the axion. It's actually called the axion because it cleans up this problem between the strong force and the weak force. And uh, in Italy, there's a uh, detergent called axion, which cleans up your clothes. So it was meant to be humorous. Um, and they called it these particles axions because they clean up a problem in particle physics. It could be, well, we think very early after the Big Bang, really, really, really early after the Big Bang, there were probably, probably a, a large number of very small black holes brought into existence. Part, we, the, so most theories seem to think that these will have merged together and uh, have evaporated, um, but maybe they're still in existence floating around and those primordial black holes left over from the first instance of the Big Bang after the Big Bang, they could still be floating around and maybe those are the dark matter. Or there's ideas such as negative mass ma matter. Um, so you may have heard of antiparticles, but antiparticles Still, if you've got two, or, or if you've got a planet, say, and a particle, the particle will be gravitationally attracted to the planet. If you've got an antiparticle, it's still gravitationally attracted to the planet. But maybe there's some kind of matter in the universe which has an, a negative mass. And so the gravitational attraction would actually push it away from the, from the planet. Uh, such things are allowed mathematically. Um, but it's, there's actually a, there's a, quite a debate at the moment in the community trying to work out whether or not the maths actually works or not. Um, that's a bit of an open question at the moment. But again, that's possibly a, a solution. And it's worth pointing out, if this, the most favoured model at the moment, if this weakly interactive mass of particle is true, then right now each of you is, has hundreds of millions of these dark matter particles going through you every second. 
Okay, so how are we going to find this dark matter? Um, or how, things that go bump in the night. This is the idea behind the title of the talk. So the idea is that we call this direct detection of dark matter. It's um, a very direct way of measuring it. And the idea is that we've got um, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is sitting inside a dark matter halo of all these particles, which are moving relatively slowly. Earth is um, bound to our galaxy. It's next to the sun, and the sun is spinning around in the galaxy. And so the Earth is flying through the, this wind, or it sees a wind of these wimps coming towards it. And so we search for the very rare collisions uh, generated by this weak nuclear force or something similar to the weak nuclear force. Uh, and we see those collisions with a, a detector here on Earth. So going back to this image of the night sky over Dublin at the moment, um, it turns out that the direction we're flying in in the galaxy is towards Cygnus, uh, the Northern Cross. So we'd be seeing this, these dark matter particles are flowing towards us from Cygnus. Uh, and maybe occasionally they bounce into us and if we can de develop a detector that can see that, uh, we, can, we can detect dark matter. We have to do this um, deep underground because of these things. Cosmic rays um, are high energy particles coming towards us from uh, supernovae, from the, from the sun, from uh, very distant in, the, in space. They're very high energy particles. They hit the atmosphere and they generate huge, great uh, explosions of subatomic particles. We never notice them as humans, but if you de de uh, develop a really sensitive detector, then it lights up with a, like a candle when you see one of these. So we know, need to go deep underground, um, about a mile or a kilometer or so, and then that reduces the um, intensity of these by about a factor of a million, and that provides an environment where we can build very sensitive detectors that can see stuff. The experiment I'm gonna talk about briefly here is based in the US, uh, in South Dakota. Um, there's not a lot in South Dakota. Uh, it's, there's, it's the center of the gold rush in 1871. Um, and there's TV series called Deadwood based on the local village. Uh, there's the um, Mount Rushmore is in South Dakota. And then there's the Crazy House Horse Monument. There's also the Sanford Underground Research uh, Laboratory, which is uh, slowly gaining notoriety because of its research. Uh, it actually looks like this. Um, and these two white buildings that you can see sort of on the middle left and middle right, those are the mine shafts. And from there, there's uh, uh, lifts going um, 4, 000, well, going about 7,000 feet underground. We work on the 4,850. Hi, I hope you're enjoying Alex's talk. He's asked me to show you the kit that we wear when we're underground working here. So starting from the floor up, we have the steel toe capped boots, shin protectors, rather fetching Guantanamo Bay style high vis clothing, uh, a utility belt that carries our self-rescuer, that contains a face mask that filters out carbon monoxide in the case of a fire. We have a hard hat and finally a lamp. There you go, back to you Alex. Thanks Jan. Um, I just want to emphasize working underground is a really fun environment, it's really really exciting. Um, the, the cage ride going up and down the mine shaft takes about seven minutes and is quite a confined enclosed environment and if you have trouble with lifts then it can be difficult. But once you're underground, it's quite a, a, a nice environment to work. Um, I feel very comfortable down. It's also really great to get hay fever because all the air is filtered down there. So um, you can be up above ground suffering terribly with hay fever. You get underground and suddenly it's blissful down there. So how do we actually do this? Well, you essentially build a bucket of something that emits light when one of these uh, particles hits it. Uh, turns out, technically we call that thing um, a liquid xenon time projection chamber. It looks something like this. This is a, one, a previous detector um, while it was being built, but it's, it's very shiny and gleamy and lots of uh, pretty surfaces. Um, I don't have time to tell you about how it actually works, but I've got a brief little movie. And the idea is that one of these dark matter particles comes in, scatters inside, and that generates a little flash of light. Um, in that scattering event, we actually liberate a few electrons from the atoms and there's an electric field placed across it, which drifts some of these electrons up to a gas region at the top. That generates another little flash of light. And by looking at the two flashes of light that you get and looking for the characteristics of that, you can tell whether or not you've had a dark matter particle scatter in your detector. The most recent, this is a really exciting time right now. This is the, uh, an expert, a, a, um, a, a detector that's just recently be been built. This, these are photos from it being built at the Rutherford Appleton lab or the, the uh, 
the container for it being built at the Rutherford Axon Lab. Um, it's called Lux Zeppelin. It's going underground at the moment. Um, and I've got a little movie here, which hopefully will play. How do you get a 5,000 pound, nine foot tall dark matter detector nearly a mile underground? Very carefully. In Sanford Underground Research Facility's surface clean room, the Lux Zeppelin collaboration spent months assembling LZ's inner detector. In October, it was ready for transport to the underground. This high stakes move was meticulously planned and practiced. It required transporting the detector from the clean room to the Yates head frame, down a mile deep shaft and through a narrow drift on the 4850 level, all without damaging or dirtying the detector. To keep LZ well sealed from any contaminants during its journey, the detector was triple wrapped in protective plastic and secured in a frame for transport. A forklift slowly carried the detector to the Yates head frame. There, engineers carefully attached the frame to the underside of the cage with slings and straps. The detector narrowly fit in the elevator shaft. A trip that normally lasts 12 minutes took over an hour as the crew slowly moved the detector nearly a mile underground. Once detached from the cage on the 4850 level, the detector was moved through the drift using air skates on a temporarily assembled surface. That evening, LZ collaboration members around the world received news that the move was successful. Now the detector must be installed in the Davis Cavern water tank. There, in 2020, LZ will begin its search for dark matter. Okay, so that was um, a, a few months ago. Um, it said 2020, well, there's been COVID, which has slowed us down a bit. Um, but that, that instrument being, uh, as it was being moved, it's worth pointing out, there were 60,000 components inside that, very delicate. We've been turning it on recently, starting to going through the commissioning process. And we can tell, to a large extent, at least it's working. Um, when I say to a large extent, that doesn't mean things are not working. It just means some of the things we haven't tested yet. Very soon, we will be turning on this instrument and it's got a sensitivity of, sensitivity of about a factor of 100 better than any previous instrument. So there's a really good chance that we're gonna see something soon. And if we do, it's by particles going into it, bumping off something, maybe in the night, maybe in the daytime. And these are kind of like ghost-like particles floating through space. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm not really meaning to advertise this book, um, but Dark Matter, A Ghost Story, hopefully that's a little bit what we've talked about. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you so much, Alex. That was absolutely fascinating. I certainly learned a lot of things that I didn't previously know about uh, your subject area. Um, and the, the thought of being in that lift for seven minutes is very unappealing to me, but I think that you're, you're very brave to do that kind of in-person research. So we've had quite a few questions on the chat and you know, we're happy to, to take um, more as they come in. So where the, one of the first questions actually um, came in from um, Donal Hurley, he's just a couple. Um, so this was kind of early on in your talk, I think you were about, uh, about slide five where, where you were talking about the amount of dark material versus um, the number of visible stars. And Donal was asking um, about sort of the, the timeline of, of those discoveries and uh, were they sort of before the Maxwell Boltzmann model of velocity distributions or what was that kind of timeline? Um, well, it, it would have been after Maxwell Boltzmann given the mm -hmm. period in time when those two were living. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what can I say? Um, certainly I, I can tell you that our model at the moment still for um, how the dark matter is distributed in our galaxy assumes that it is this a gas of particles, essentially a gas of particles, um, a spherically symmetric halo of gas self-gravitating. If you work out how the speed distribution for those particles, you end up with a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Mm. Um, now, is that correct or not? There's, uh, we, we should hopefully be finding, well, we are starting to find out right now through independent means. And that is the, there's a satellite in orbit at the moment, Gaia, which is planning to um, measure a billion st stars in our galaxy. It's quite astonishing. It's gonna measure the speeds and positions of a billion stars in our galaxy. 
Now, if you make the assumption, just like the tree, the leaves blowing around on a bush, that the motion of the stars is being influenced by the dark matter around it, then by measuring the speeds of the stars, we can actually have a get a good handle on what the velocity distribution of the dark matter is in our galaxy. The first results are in already, and it shows that our um, the model that we've been using is broadly correct, at least. Mm -hmm. I think it's there's different measurements coming in from Gaia, which are showing some rather the different measurements are depending on the analysis, you get a different answer. Broadly, we're correct. There may be some interesting nuances in there. Um, but broadly, it does look like it's maximal Boltzmann distribution. OK, um, I'm going to move on to a question from Terry, uh, Terry Mosley, uh, who asks, is there any evidence of dark matter from studying the motions of the bodies in the far outer solar system? No. OK. No answer. And the reason is that um, the, the scale of the dark matter halo is thought to be about um, uh, about 10 times, well, five to 10 times larger than the size of our galaxy. Okay. So the scale of our solar system compared to that scale is so, so tiny, we, we would never have a chance of seeing anything. Sure. Okay. Um, the next question is from Becky, who asks, where did the proportion of matter being neutrinos come from when we don't have a known mass of neutrinos, so we only have an upper bound? Absolutely. Um, we have an upper bound, though. And if you assume that upper bound, the most it can contribute is something like one or two percent of the dark matter. Okay, okay, so it's less than that. I'm not saying it's saying it is that much. It's just less mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, I really liked that slide actually, where, where you had that that blue bar chart showing. You know, this is this is kind of what we know, and yeah. this is what we don't know. I think it's it's a really nice um, kind of honesty of you know these are the the outstanding questions and and I didn't mention just, energy which is of yeah, course another huge elephant in the room. Yeah, it's it's just kind of mind bending when you think of you know the effort that some of, some really bright minds have put into this problem already. I think it's I really liked actually when you were um, sort of crossing out all the the different possibilities for you know which which um, fundamental building blocks could be linked to and of course that's that's how science progresses is is you you get rid of the wrong answers and, and see what you're left with. Um, okay. Another question actually from Donal. Um, Donal asks, um, electromagnetic and weak forces have been unified theoretically. Would it not yeah. be strange if dark matter responds to one but not the other? So they are unified theoretically, uh, as in um, the, our understanding of electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force um, is such that we, we know that at high energy scales, they behave in the same way but there's this spontaneous symmetry breaking as it's known at, uh, at the weak scale, um, below which they behave somewhat differently. So it's, it's like uh, water and ice. Um, but they're the same material, mm -hmm. but at, at a high enough temperature, they will behave the same, steam basically, um, or water vapor, um, but at low temperatures, they behave very differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Sure, okay. Um, another question from uh, Connor, Connor Farrell. So um, is the dark matter halo around a spiral galaxy also rotating? And if so, or even if not, how does this impact the coalescence of visible matter into a disk? Right, so um, why is our galaxy and why are any galaxies rotating? That's because we think that the, um, we started out with the, um, essentially the, the dust, whatever, left over from the Big Bang, which is distributed more or less evenly through the universe. But you have slight um, differences in density. And when you have a slightly higher density, over enough time, the material around it collapses down and, and gets together. And it collapses down because the particles of the normal matter are bouncing into each other, sticking to each other, and they do interact with one another. So that, uh, that um, that history of the uh, normal matter collapsing down into smaller structures is because it interacts with itself. And as, it's been, as it collapses down, just like a, an ice skater pulling their legs in, it spins up. So if there's any net uh, non-zero amount of angular momentum, that angular momentum is conserved. And if it's on, spread over a huge distance, 
it's conserved to when you bring it down to a much smaller distance because the material's collapsed and so it starts spinning much much more, much more rapidly mm -hmm. so that's why our galaxy is is spinning fast as such the dark matter it doesn't interact with other stuff so it's never gone through this process of, of spinning up mm -hmm. so that's why we think that the dark matter is more or less stationary as a net effect in a halo and our galaxy is spinning around much faster inside it now it could be that there is a small amount of interaction between the normal matter spinning quite fast and the dark matter and if that's the case then maybe it's made some of the dark matter start spinning as well um, that's a little bit of an open question, um, but you can you can model all of this on a computer. You um, set up a set of you sort of postulate what you think the dark the dark matter and the normal matter might have looked like very early in the universe. Build in your laws of physics and press the go button and run it 13.8 billion years forwards, and you you do end up with something that looks like the universe we have if you put in initial conditions that firstly include dark matter and include fairly weak interactions between the dark matter and the normal matter. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the universe looks like it does kind of tells us that the dark matter is another way of telling us that the dark matter has a very um, weak interaction where I mean weak just sort of uh, weak as opposed to technically the, the scientific term weak. Um, yeah. So I think it, it, that assumption that the dark matter is not rotating very fast is almost certainly true, but we, we can't really test it at the moment. If we can start measuring the dark matter scatterings in our detectors, then with enough of those scatterings, you can actually tell what the speed distribution of the dark matter is. And so we can actually then measure it. And that would be a really interesting uh, measurement to make once we've made the discovery. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay, there's a couple of other questions that are coming in sort of around that same theme of um, you know, from one from Tony, uh, you know, why can there not possibly be enough neutrinos to account for dark matter, even though they're very light? I guess you've touched on this a little bit already. Maybe do you want to expand on that at all? So, um, could even there be, the answer is well, we, we, we can, can okay, so part of the issue there is we can detect neutrinos. We have technologies that can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we know, and the measurements that we've made of the numbers of neutrinos have matched the predictions that we have from where we think neutrinos are coming from, mm -hmm. um, with some exceptions. So one of the, one of the big things was that um, neutrinos from our sun, um, you can work out how many of those you expect to be seeing, because we know that those are basically being produced by the nuclear fusion that's occurring in the center of the star generating its light. And from the, you, we know how much fusion there must be because we know how bright the sun is, and so we know how many neutrinos should be coming out. When that was measured, um, rather fewer than we thought should be there were, were detected. And that, that's the, um, it turns out that the, uh, that was evidence for the neutrinos changing flavor as it's called. So the electron neutrinos generated in the nuclear fusion were turning into mu and tau neutrinos on the way to us. Uh, and that discovery of neutrino oscillations as it's known led to a Nobel Prize and that experiment was based exactly in the same cavern where we're now building Lux Zeppelin. Interestingly enough, it's actually the same place where we'll be doing it. The other thing is that, so we've, we've measured the, and we now understand with neutrino oscillations and things, we understand the solar neutrinos very well. We've also measured in one case, the neutrinos coming from a core collapse supernova in 1987. So that, and those, that measurement kind of matches with the model that we have for core collapse supernova neutrinos. There's another model for neutrinos um, or another source for neutrinos, which is essentially left over from the Big Bang, um, primordial neutrinos. We've never measured those, um, but there's a, a very, I think we would argue a very robust understanding of how many there should be. And uh, we've measured the, well, we've got upper limits on the masses for the neutrinos. Um, and so assuming that upper limit and the numbers of neutrinos we think are there, uh, that's the upper limit for the amount of mass that dark can be made of uh, dark matter from neutrinos. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another question, which is is related to um, you know that that standard model, like I suppose, is could there be more than one Higgs particle? Um, the others with mass greater than the one point one hundred twenty five um, giga electron volts. That uh, yes, and that is absolutely. Um, uh, 
number one, or well, one of the very strongest uh, drivers of the ongoing physics program at the LHC. Um, it can't be, I, th I think we're, we're confident enough, uh, you're, you're pushing me out of my area of expertise a little bit, but I, I'm pretty certain that there can't be any more uh, dark matter, uh, any more Higgs particles to really affect the conclusions that we see from on the dark matter side. But in terms of understanding the, the standard model of particle physics, because we know the standard model is incomplete, it doesn't explain dark matter. Um, there's all these other questions associated with it that make no sense at the moment. Um, so trying to understand and get a better understanding of um, this standard model of particle physics, that there's much, there's great motivation for doing that aside from dark matter and dark energy and things. Um, and really trying to understand what the nature of that Higgs boson is or whether there's more than one Higgs boson, whether the Higgs is quite the same one as Peter Higgs, Edinburgh graduate, Ed, Edinburgh lecturer, I should point out. Um, uh, is, it, is that the same thing? That, that's really tying down that, the properties of the Higgs boson, uh, absolutely forefront physics at the moment ongoing at the LHC. Sure. Um, an instrumentation question. Someone asks about the ice cube detector. Is, is the ice cube detector looking for dark matter with neutrinos? Um, so ice cube is uh, this um, kilometer cubed uh, instrumented ice deep down under uh, Antarctica. Um, so the, the, the particles that, or the interactions we're looking for from dark matter are the actual dark matter particles themselves scattering off these atoms of xenon in our detector. When they do so, they generate tiny, tiny little flashes of light. And so we need a really very sensitive um, instrument. Uh, Ice Cube is a completely different technology and they would never see the signals that we're looking for. But there are other models for what dark matter might be, mm -hmm. um, which maybe they would be sensitive to. So I think they, they, they will certainly be, be contributing to the search, excuse me, for dark matter, but in a somewhat different way. Okay. Um, a, a sort of nomenclature or, or terminology question now. So someone uh, is sort of referred to uh, something called the luminiferous ether and saying that, uh, you know, they, they had read a little bit about that and that it was previously considered to, to make up space as we understand it today. And, and the nature of their question is, is asking essentially how, how and why do physicists give, give sort of new or different names? So why did the physics community um, decide to invent a new term for something which um, had previously um, perhaps had. Um... Right, so um, the, luminous, the luminiferous ether uh, was a concept that came into being um, before the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay, so um, light uh, is a, undergoes diffraction, it undergoes um, interference. So light is clearly a wave-like phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. You can put it into a prism and it diffracts away. Um, now wave-like phenomena um, are like waves on water or sound waves. They require a medium to propagate. If you take the air out of a bell jar, you can't make any sound in it. There's no medium for the sound to propagate. So it was thought at the, so, um, before in sort of the, until uh, I don't know the precise, precise dates, but sort of in the 1800s and maybe the early 1900s, um, that light must be a wave and waves needed something to, meet, to propagate in. So that thing was called the luminiferous ether. It's the material in which light propagated. But if, that, if it did do that, then um, you would expect, if light is a, a wave propagating in a medium, then if you're moving relative to that medium, the speed of the light would change. Mm -hmm. And the Michelson-Morley experiment is this very famous uh, tabletop interference device where you send a beam of light and you split it into 90 degree different directions and then bring it back together again. Um, and you look at the interference fringes from the two different directions. And if you, wrote, if you look at, if you, if you have an eyepiece looking at the light frame pattern, you see an interference pattern one of those beams might be going with the direction of the luminiferous ether and the other one going at 90 degrees to it. And it turns out that if, the, if there is a this sort of river of ether going past us, you'd expect those two path lengths, you'd expect the light to be traveling at different speeds along those two paths. 
because one of them is just going across and back again and the other one is going downstream with the speed of the light with the speed of the ether and back upstream against the speed of the ether now when you rotate that instrument um the speed of the extra speed that one has compared to the other would change to the other path and so you'd see this interference pattern move mm -hmm. the answer is that you don't see any change in the pattern and so that kind of proves that together with the other things that's showing you that the speed of light is constant regardless of the direction that you're moving in this ether so there, there is no ether um so this was um it was a great change it, it directly led into einstein's theory of general of special relativity at least which he then went on to develop into the general theory of relativity um so so, so then this idea of the luminous luminiferous ether it's difficult to say yeah um, <laughs> However, the reason it's kind of coming back into fashion is that this idea of some kind of medium permeating through all space is very similar to what we think dark energy must be. Um, mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. Dark, dark energy is not the, uh, uh, I don't think, is going to be the medium within which light propagates. It's a different thing, but it's still a substance that we think kind of uh, fills all of space. So that's kind of why people will be hearing about it again at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. These are fantastic um, questions coming in and, and extremely thorough answers. So I, you know, I'm going to try and get through as many as I can in the in the next sort of it's ten minutes done. or so. If you're if you're you're still um, you've got hopefully you've got some. I'm like, answering them. So. Okay, that, no, that's great. Um, okay, Daniel asks, what are the evidences that dark matter does not interact via a strong force? So um, if it did have a strong force, then um, it would start the strong force is strong right that's its fundamental property um so dark matter particles would be colliding into each other uh, much more frequently and when they did so you would you would see um radiation emitted uh in those scatterings x-rays typically and we don't see huge amounts of x-rays uh coming from uh areas where we we know there must be dark matter so it can't have a strong force if it did we'd be seeing light coming from it that we don't see Okay. Um, right. Uh, one from Ross. I know there are some others before that, but um, which I thought was just very direct. Why have all attempts to detect dark matter on Earth so far failed? Oh, good question. Um, so uh, we think it's because we don't have a detector that's sensitive enough. So when I say sensitive enough, the um, the the interact so the model has that right now you me everyone else has hundreds of uh, millions of these particles scanning through us all the time um but the the chance for any one of those particles to scatter off us is mind -bogg bogglingly small so that um the actual scatterings happen very rarely at the moment our limit on how often these things are scattering equates to something like um one dark matter particle scattering in 100 kilograms of material uh, once every year. It's that kind of rate or lower. And that's just to do with the properties of the, um, the dark matter. If it, had, um, if it had an electromagnetic interaction, it would be scattering far, far, far more often. Um, with the weak interaction, it's scattering at this kind of rate or so. Um, so we're, really, we're testing the, the strength of the interaction between dark matter and normal matter. And it's just, it's, it's nature has given us a, a, a fundamental property where it's smaller than that number. So the only thing you can do is build a bigger detector. Mm -hmm. You're testing one event per 10 tons of material per year, or you can run it for longer. It turns out to be much better to build a, we can build something that's a hundred times bigger, a lot quicker than we can wait a hundred times longer. Yes. The other option of course, is that we're looking in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. and dark matter has a different set of properties to those that we're sensitive to. So we're desperately trying to build detectors that cover as many different possibilities as possible. But it's certainly possible that we're just looking in the wrong place. Yeah, it's a great problem that really crosses over theoretical, the, the extremes of theoretical physics and, you know, challenges to, to what we can, can physically build. Um, okay, uh, Stephen asks, could there be a fifth fundamental force like one suggested as an explanation for dark energy that could interact with baryons in matter to produce 
the observed effects that are attributed to time. I'm willing to bet that there's a large number of particle physicists, theorists, who've come up with such a model. Absolutely, okay. there could. Um, you, you need to know a lot, an awful lot of mathematics, um, and then you can start constructing weird and wonderful models where these things are possible. Um, mm -hmm. When you do so, you've got to come up with a model which um, explains the phenomenon you're looking for, but also is consistent with all the other measurements that we have. Uh, and that's not so easy, but there certainly are exotic models which can do these kind of things. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to get a question from, from people who, who I haven't um, already come to. So there's one from Michael. There are so many questions. You'll see the chat um, after Alex and, and, and hopefully you can you might want to follow up um, individually. So Michael asks, are there questions in the universe, sorry, are there regions <laughs> in the universe without dark matter, including galaxies which rotate in a pure Keplerian way? Or on a larger scale, are there dark matter density fluctuations like you see in the cosmic microwave background? Yes. So there's certainly some um, galaxies where, uh, th this is a really interesting question and it's absolutely topical for ongoing measurements at the moment. There, there are certainly some observations um, of uh, galaxies. Um, so, so it's, it's called the, that, I introduced um, an M for the total, the dynamical mass and L for the uh, luminiferous mass. mass. And the ratio of M over L, if it were one, then you've got no dark matter because you've just got the normal matter. Uh, the number of stars makes up the total number of mass. Um, so you can measure this ratio of M over L in various dis different ways. And there's been some recent results showing some galaxies which have essentially no dark matter in them. Um, which is really interesting because if, if dark matter were explained through some some other mechanisms, such as we a, a different understanding of how gravity works, then you would always get the same result that there's this amount, this difference with the amount of dark matter there. The fact that you see some galaxies which appear to have no dark matter tells you that the ones where you do have dark matter, it really is dark matter and not something else. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you, this then poses other problems such as what is the mechanism by which galaxies form um, such that you can end up with different amounts of uh, dark matter in them? Mm -hmm. And um, really, you think, well, there's also probably dark matter only galaxies where there's no matter, mat normal matter in them. Um, how do you, how do you, how does the universe work such that you end up with differing amounts of dark matter in different galaxies? Mm -hmm. um, and that's an ongoing problem and a very exciting one. And there's a lot of research going into it right now. Okay. I might just take one. Mm maybe two more. Um, what about the sterile neutrino and its detection? Okay, so um, we know that there are three neutrinos, normal neutrinos, and we can do this because of um, the width of the W particle, okay, which is a technical thing, um, but the, the mass of the W particle is about 91 GeV um, over C squared, technically, um, but it's actually got an un not an uncertainty to it, but it's um, <clears> some <throat> If you measure lots of them, you'll find that they've got a distribution of masses um, based around this 91 or so. And uh, it turn, turns out that, that the width of that, um, of the W mass is, depends on the number of neutrinos that we have. And you, so you can measure the number of neutrinos and you can measure it to be 3.01 or something, um, plus or minus 0.2. So it, it's, it, it's clearly three, not two, not four. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so the number of neutrinos is three. However, you can, when you do lots of, um, you sort of explore these additional models to the standard model, many of these theories come up with particles which are very like neutrinos in many ways, but are subtly different in others. And some of those are called sterile neutrinos. So they're neutrinos which have typically are heavier, um, and they're sterile because they wouldn't contribute to this uh, broadening of the of the uh, Z boson. So those are the the Z boat that the sterile neutrinos. Um, if they exist, then they could be a candidate for dark matter. Absolutely. Okay. Um, right. I'm going to just take uh, a, a final kind of sciencey question, which is uh, from Neil. So, is dark matter contributing to the expansion of the universe, and if so, how? Uh, I'm going to say no, 
Okay. Okay. On the grounds that so dark matter is something which provides additional gravity, which kind of pulls things together. Mm -hmm. um, dark and it pulls things together on the scale of galaxies and things like that and galaxy clusters. Dark energy, which we know even less about, is something which is making the uh, expansion of the universe. It is expanding, but from day to day, it seems to be expanding faster and faster and faster. So it's making the it's increasing the rate of expansion. And that's on a scale of the whole universe together. Now, the as we the, the so dark matter is the thing is like I said, it's basically just a name. It's the name for whatever it is that's making this um, additional providing this additional attraction on scales of galaxies. Whereas dark energy is whatever it is that's that's uh, providing acceleration to the whole universe as a whole. Mm -hmm. Are they totally different? It seems, it's, it seems unlikely to me that they're totally different. So I would, I would be delighted if some someone can come up with a, a coherent model that we can prove that shows how dark matter and dark energy are perhaps two different coins of the same new property that we don't know about. So certainly dark matter is not contributing to the expansion of the universe, but it might be something which is bound up with the same overall thing that's happening. And that'd be really exciting. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, there, there are more more questions than than I, I could 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 get to, um, and I, I I did my best to get, to get to as many as I could. Um, there's also a lot of people who like your Millennium Falcon, uh, so that's you know good. <laughs> you can like fly it around for us if you would like. Um, I want a very quick question. Someone asked about the name of the book that you mentioned at the end. Dark matter. <laughs> it's it, it's not to do with dark matter, right? It's um. Okay. It's actually a ghost story set in the um, some in, in Norway, Sweden, something like that. Um, okay. it, it's it's quite disturbing in a way, um, mm. but it's it's a really good book. It's called Dark Matter for other reasons, um, but Dark Matter, a ghost story. It seems like the right book to advertise tonight, right? Sure. I guess if people want to learn a bit more, um, they can Google you. They can you 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 advertise a Facebook page at the beginning of your that's, talk. That's so. the Sanford Underground Research Facility, which is where a lot of this um, work goes on. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is slightly dangerous. You can you can search on the web, and there's mm -hmm. an endless amount of material on the web for dark matter. Yes. Not all of it is correct. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Google. Yeah, we'll put a, a warning. Um, yes, Google at your own risk. Um, but there's clearly an enormous amount of interest in what you're doing. Um, I think it's really inspiring from a, from a sort of mind bending theoretical physics perspective, but also I think just it's really interesting to see the ways in which, um, you know, the instrumentation and, and um, yeah, the ways in which people are, are um, trying observational tests of, of what is, yeah, oh, probably one of the greatest uh, questions of our, of our generation. There's a lot of thanks coming in as well. I'm um, going to shout out to Becky Nisbet, one of my students, I see. Oh, just... right. Oh, good. I, th I think I got to one of Becky's questions. Yeah. I, 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 yes, I hope I did. Um, so thank you so much. You know, if we were all here in person, um, you know, I'm sure we would have a drink and there would be a very long line of, of people yeah, wanting yeah. to talk to you in person. Yeah. Um, but we really appreciate your time. Just, um, uh, just before we close. So, you know, thank you um, on behalf of, of myself and, and all of us here at Dias for for spending your, your Halloween um, night with us. 